Don't do it. Just, just don't do it. Please. Please. For the love of all that is statistical, do not do it. Don't do what? Please, please do not use Excel for data preparation and quality control. Please don't do it. I had a student recently, a graduate student, who was collecting data from Qualtrics. And in order for his data set to be analyzable, analyzable, if that's a word, there were several things he needed to do. One is get rid of a bunch of columns that he didn't need, just to clean things up a bit. Two, he needed to rename all the columns because they're like Q1, Q2, Q3, but he needed to put the actual names of the questions that he was asking people. And then once he did that, he needed to create some scores because he was giving them a bunch of different surveys like, hey, here's the Beck Depression Inventory Survey with all these items. Or here's some stress scale with all these items. And so all the stress items had it, all the stress items had it. So all the stress items had to be added up. That's a tongue twister. Ask me how I know, because I did it three times. All the depression items had to be summed up. And so he had to do that. And also several items needed to be recoded. Anything that was a five needed to be a one. And if it was a four, it needed to be a two, etc. And unfortunately, these um, items, these questions, these variables that they needed to modify to be reverse coded, they weren't in sequence. So it's like the third, 15th, and 27th item. And so there's a lot of stuff that he had to do to this data set before it could be analyzed. And his idea was, why don't I just do all that in Excel? And I almost shouted at him, but I have a reputation to maintain, so I kept my cool. And I said, please do not do that. Please don't do that. Because here's the thing. So his committee defense, like the document and the actual defense, happened like a month after data collection would end. And that wouldn't leave him enough time to do the data analysis. And so he was trying to get a head start and just take uh, whatever participants he had at the time, several months in advance, to just practice with the analysis. And so he was going to do all these things manually in Excel, only to have to do it again, like, two or three months later, again. And I said, please don't do that for multiple reasons. One, what happens if you make a mistake? That's gonna be really hard to find where the mistake came from because there's no history of what you did in Excel. And again, it's gonna be super time consuming because you're gonna have to do it again. So a much better way is to write an R script that does all that for you, like this one. And the cool thing about that is A, there's a record, B, in two months time or however long it takes, all you have to do is import the new data set and hit run. That's it. But if he were to do that in Excel, he'd have to do all that manual deleting and renaming columns. He'd have to do all that over again. And that would just be super lame. But when we do it in R, it's repeatable. It's transparent. It's easy to debug. It's non-destructive. So you're not actually altering the file like you would with Excel. And you can scale it for your project quite easily. Now let's think of a simple example where this could go wrong. Suppose I need to do the following to my data set. Maybe I need to rename the variables. Maybe, like my graduate student, I need to reverse code some of the items. And maybe I need to apply a log transformation on a variable. And then maybe for those participants that didn't respond, maybe in the file it says missing. And I know when I import that into R, I don't want it to say missing. I just want it to be empty. And so I do a control F or a command F or I can't remember what the equivalent is for replace. Control shift R maybe, I don't know. Anyway, you do a find and replace and then you find all the times the word missing happens and then get rid of them. But unbeknownst to you, in a separate column, maybe it's asking about like parental involvement in their childhood milestones or something like that and one of the categories is missing, meaning the parent was missing from their life. And inadvertently, because you did that find and replace, you removed an entire category from that variable. That's a problem. Regardless, let's say those are all the things you have to do. And you decide you're going to be a super conscientious researcher and save different versions of that Excel file. So every time you make a change, you save the file. 
my dash amazing dash thesis dash data dash underscore January underscore 18 dash B dash final underscore final final underscore final for real dot XLSX. Back in my day, it was just XLS. Why you got to be adding extra letters to it? So then when you finally get around to getting ready to do your data analysis, what do you find? Maybe one of your sum scales is supposed to go from zero to 20. And instead you find it goes from like five to 402. So, you know, somewhere in there, there's a quality control issue. What do you do? You're kind of stuck. Now, fortunately, in this scenario, the person saved different versions, but you're going to have to then go back and try to figure out where the error came from. And that's going to be incredibly tedious to do. So debugging in Excel is like trying to unscramble your eggs. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. But if you used R instead, whoo, man, wow. Ah. No contest, man, none whatsoever. It leaves a very clear paper trail because the paper trail is the instructions to run the analysis. So it's going to make it way easier to find that error. It is non-destructive. It's not altering the original file. It's creating a new version in R's memory that you're modifying. And you could always return to the original if you screw something up. But also it enables collaboration with others. Do you know how many times I've been stuck on an R problem and then somebody says, oh, you forgot to close this parentheses or whatever. It helps to have two sets of eyes on it. And you can't really do that with Excel. But R, you can share your code with somebody and collaborate with them. And that's so cool. And then once you correct the error, it's super easy to rerun the analysis. You're not like pointing and clicking all over the place to make something happen. And finally, it just scales so gracefully. So gracefully, my dear. It does not matter if you have 10,000 or 10 million observations, it shall not break all as it would excel. Just scales beautifully, man. I'm telling you. Oh no, wait a minute. I use Excel all the time to teach my students because it's faster. Wrong. It is not faster because you spend so much time correcting your errors. Or maybe you're in the miracle situation where you don't commit any errors. That took time. It takes time to not make errors and to be careful. That takes a lot of time. Probably going to be way less time to just write it in R. And another reason it's not faster, like when you are programming in R, your hands are here. Um, I can't move my camera. It's kind of fixed, but just imagine. All right, we're going to figure this out. This is R. This is how we do things in R. But in Excel, what are we doing? We're alternating between this thing, a mouse and a keyboard. And I don't know about you, okay, but that just drives me crazy. I hate when I have to take my hands off the keyboard to use the mouse. And when you are doing things in Excel, you essentially have to do that. So no, it's not faster. Oh, now wait a minute. I will say it does have certainly a smaller barrier to entry. You hardly have to know a lick of programming to use Excel. Well, I'll give you that one. True. But that barrier can become a trap because it creates a habit that can't be audited. You cannot audit. I guess if you put like, if you're like recording somebody's screen, you could audit it. But who wants to do that? And I think the final problem with that is that it delays learning something that is actually practical like R. Okay, but it teaches students better because they're doing things by hand and using like a point and click interface doesn't teach them a thing about doing stats. Uh, maybe no, 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 that's not how it goes. I've talked about this before and I'll link that video in the description, but the way I see it, doing things by hand is actually an advanced technique. No novice to statistics should ever do an analysis by hand of any sort, even if you're using Excel to help you along. Never. Because students need a conceptual understanding first. And this hit me like 10 years ago when I was teaching a student about the central limit theorem. This is back when I taught more traditionally stats classes and a lot of that required hand calculations. And I was teaching students conceptually what the central limit theorem is because I think the central limit theorem is kind of a big deal. And I was trying to conceptually teach them what the central limit theorem was. 
and one student, I can still remember the look on her face. She's like, uh, professor, um, can you just like show us how to calculate it? And I was dumbfounded. And I thought, how to calculate the central limit theorem? What, what do you, like, you are so off in your question. Like, that doesn't even make sense. What I'm trying to explain is conceptual. It's not a calculation. And it was then that I had that light bulb moment. Oh. Yeah, no wonder my students said this because I've been training them the entire semester that there are calculations and those are the important things. But no, those aren't the important things because computers do that for you. The important thing is understand what's going on. And if you're so worried about the sequence and getting the steps right and getting the right answers, you're not going to have any space in your brain to conceptualize what is going on. Wow, my voice is like raspy today. I don't know why, but I can lean into that. I think it's just because it's like 1.35 a.m. right now. I'm <laughs> recording this video really late. Okay, fine. I won't use Excel. What do I use instead? Fair question, young man. Fair question, young, attractive, intelligent man that you are. What's your skincare routine? Fair question. The best option is going to be a scripting language. Language. Like R or Python. Because you have full control over everything that happens to your data set. And you have a full history of what exactly is being done at each stage of the data manipulation process. And in addition, it has built-in functions that just Excel doesn't have. Like joining two tables together based on somebody's ID, for example, or going from wide format to long format. That's super tedious to do in Excel. And when you're using R or Python, you write the script once and once it's set, then you can reuse that over and over and over again. That's pretty amazing. Alternative number two would be like SPSS or Jamovi or Jasp or one of these point and click interfaces because most of them have some sort of logging that happens. So when you run an analysis, now there's more for analysis, but if you run an analysis, it'll say, hey, you did this analysis and then you did this analysis. What I don't know is whether it does logging for data manipulations. And I suspect it does. But the problem is a lot of these software programs weren't designed for data manipulation. So the type of data manipulations you might need to do could be pretty awkward, if not impossible to do in these things. Although most of them, I'm pretty sure it's pretty easy to do like a transformation on a variable or to rename a variable or to recode a variable or to create some scales. I think those are pretty easy to do. Some of the more complex things like joining data sets or going from wide to long or something like that, those might be a little more difficult. So they're better in Excel, but they still suck. And Excel is the worst. There's no record of what happened. It encourages this copy and paste workflow that is super tedious and super error prone. So yeah, please don't use Excel for data manipulation. Well, I would never use it for data manipulation, but I do use it from time to time for statistical analysis. <sighs> oh, that is so much worse. Yeah, do I really need to go into that? I don't think I will, but please don't use Excel for data analysis, especially the graphs. <laughs> So many better options out there. Definitely use those. And for those, the point and click ones are really good. Like Jasp or Jamovi. So yeah, if you don't know R, stop procrastinating or Python. Of course, I can't help you with the Python. I don't. Uh, Python and I um, are not on speaking terms. Not because I did anything offensive or because Python did anything offensive. It's just we don't speak the same language so we are literally not on speaking terms but if you want to learn r you can take my online r course which i'm linking in the description and by the way um in less than two weeks i am doing another live simplistics class my most popular class ever and i want to meet you gosh darn it I love meeting you in Zoom. And you know, the reaction is always the same. It's like, ah, you're real. You exist in real life. You're not an AI. And they like treat me like I'm famous and stuff, which is kind of weird because I'm just a dork talking about stats.
but I'm a famous dork talking about stats. So yeah, if you want to hang out with me and ask me questions live about introductory statistics, my in intro simplistics course, then please see the link in the description because it's going to be pretty amazing. I'm, I'm just telling you. I'm going to bring snacks. Um, not for you, for me. Um, but feel free, free to bring your own snacks. Um, additional incentives for coming. Um, I mean, you'll like learn and stuff and be like a stats ninja, but who cares about that? Um, let's just say it's going to bring you peace and happiness and joy and love for the rest of your life. Ish. Just be sure to read the fine print. All right, well, um, that's all I got to say about Excel. I feel the need to use a non-obvious pun um, using the word Excel and like accelerate, but I am not going to stoop to that level of making a pun. Instead, I'm going to share with you my intentions to make a pun because that is way cooler. All right, hey, it has been a delight talking to you. And I appreciate your attentiveness and your inquisitiveness and brightening my day with your glorious smile. Now, have a good evening. All right, peace out. Bye. Duck. <laughs> Dummy. Oh, well, that's not what I was taught in graduate school. Yeah, well, you were taught by dinosaurs or something. Because humans hadn't been invented yet. And somehow you metamorphed into a... From a dinosaur into a human. <laughs> Oi, this isn't about being perfect. It's about having a blast, it is. Talking about statistics. Why do we talk about statistics, huh? Well, hmm. Because it'll save your life. It'll make you more attractive. It'll bring peace and happiness all over the world. Now, if that's the case, then why are you so depressed all the time? Hey, I didn't ask for your commentary. Yeah, but if you take it to the logical conclusion... Well, you shut up, alright? If you take it to the logical conclusion, either you are not an expert in stats, in which case you have not yet reached happiness, or you are in the statement that you just said is a lying piece of argument. Can't argue with that. Yes. Welcome to Simplistics, the place where hyperbole is welcome. That's all we're doing. We're just being inclusive. We're like welcoming hyperbole. Yeah. Are you going to discriminate against hyperbole? Hmm? Hmm? Didn't think so.